I... Well, I guess when you have a family, that's the sacrifice you Sacrifice, make. exactly. I sacrificed. The ultimate sacrifice. My happiness for my kids. You bet I did. You bet I did. And I'd do it again, too. I'd do it over and over again. <laughs> that's my life. Over and over and over and over and over and over. And over 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 and over. Okay, Clay, I get the point. No, you don't. Sacrifice is defined as the act of suffering a great loss, especially for an ideal belief or end. In many pieces of media, a sacrifice is viewed as something positive or even at times heroic. It's an act that takes from you or your likelihood in honor of something else. Simply put, sacrifice can really be more than the simple definition that I just explained. It's a simple thing to understand, but it becomes complex in the way that people utilize it. So now my question is, what do you consider a sacrifice? Released in 2005, Adult Swim's Moral Laurel has become the internet's favorite stop-motion animated show for the last two years, and I honestly can't blame them. What started out as a dark comedy satire about Christian societies within America became one of, if not, the darkest show to come out of the network. Despite that, Moral Laurel really stood out as one of Adult Swim's best show throughout its unique animation and witty writing that helped properly tackle mature themes. And of course, with those points, it became prime content for those who love to analyze stuff that most normal people weren't really think about. AKA people with too much free time, AKA. <laughs> However, there is one aspect, or rather episode, that often gets overlooked when people talk about this show. One that challenges the audience's perception, stretches the lengths of the characters would go through, and redefines the very essence of the episode's topic. Said topic would resonate in season 3 episode 11, Sacrifice the best bottle episode in all of television. Before heading into the episode itself, first we need to establish what a bottle episode is. Often used in TV shows, bottle episodes mainly take place in a singular setting. These types of episodes are made on the cheaper side to either save money or to get episodes out faster. Even if you aren't familiar with the term, you've definitely seen a bottle episode before. Some examples are episodes like the one where no one's ready from friends or cooperative calligraphy from community. However, there are other notable bottle episodes like Breaking Bad's Fly and Bojack Horseman's Free Churro. Those two particular latter episodes would be important to note, both from their great quality and heavy dialogue. With the episode Fly, it serves to look into the psyche of the show's main character, Walter White. More specifically, the focus on his relationship with Jesse and his personal fears, something that wouldn't be tackled in the show again as Walt kept embracing his Eisenberg persona. And as for Free Churro, it gives us an introspection into Bojack's relationship with his mother as he gives a monologue in her eulogy. In full honesty, I can probably give a longer monologue explaining everything that's so great about that episode, but nah. Maybe if this video gets like 5,000 likes or something, I'll possibly reconsider it, I don't know. So while you have some bottle episodes that are cheap, others like Free Churro and Fly serve as pivotal buildups for the continuity of their shows. But buildup comes within a setup, and More Oral can only do so much to make one for its final season. Season 3 of Moral Oral was the most flimsy in terms of development behind the scenes. When Mike Lazar realized the original concept of the show was going down a more conceptually depressing path compared to its original premise, it was up until an early draft of Season 3's Episode 4's Alone, where he decided to cut Moral Oral from its future projects. This also meant cutting a lot of plotlines and characters from Season 3, specifically like Oral's grandpa having a prevalent season role. Another one of the plotlines that was cut was Blaberta and Officer Papermouth starring an affair. The idea was only at its infancy, but if developed, Loved, alongside with the other plot ideas, Season 3 would have been a lot different compared to what we have today. For what it's worth now, Season 3 is still great, even despite thinking of what it could have been. The parallels and despair from the Season 2 finale nature got me to the edge of my seat anticipating what would come out of each episode, but never did I expect what came out of Episode 11, Sacrifice. There are a lot of episodes from Season 3 that stand out to me, but the words from this episode are powerful. The episode overall is powerful. From the empathy to clashing conflicts, no matter what it is, the setup itself is powerful. And what better way to start it off than a powerful exhale?
No, literally, it starts off with Clay grunting like he came out of a reverse space. But it's part of the first person montage of Clay walking through this house. Upon the wreckage of Block and Shapey, he draws on Oral and Bulberta talking about Clay and his marriage, and ending with him going to bed. The montage occurs at specific points of the season, starting with episode 1's Numb, to explain the perspective from different key points. Simplifying it for the video's sake, the segment focuses on Clay looking at his drink. The scene later transitions into Easter Sermon, sprinkled with some flashbacks that might be important later. Who knows, really? But while there is some context to Reverend Putty's despair, he still manages to turn his speech into the first and meaningful sermon displayed in the show. It shows a lot for him to give such a... Hey, wait a minute, why isn't Clay at church? Come on! Hi, Clay. What is it, a holiday, Dolly? Easter good enough for you? Oh, right. We find Clay waiting to get into the bar instead of being at church with his family. Once he's led in by the waitress Dolly, he discusses some quick sorrows, like the hunting trip from nature and the walls of paperwork he has to do for his stinking dead-end job. He goes on about how being young and free is taken for granted, and for the sake of his family and job, he is now asked to do too much for what he has to- It's over! So a man, a priest, an officer, and a doctor all walk into a bar. We know why the man walked in, but what about everyone else? You think God can't see into the future? He can see weeks into the future, bub! Oh god. Despite his moments of racism and narcissism, Reverend Putty is actually one of the kind folk from Moralton. For the most part, he is always willing to try and listen to the concerns and sins from the town's citizens. Except for one specific person. Florence. Florence is the wife, or I guess ex-wife, of Officer Papermouth, who was already on a rocky condition with her through the way he treated his job, and after an incident of Papermouth proving his cowardice, Florence decided to leave him and later move on into an apartment with an acquaintance, Dottie. As she lived with Dottie, she takes in a lot of verbal abuse and arguments, but finds comfort through her love of Reverend Putty for the confidence and determination he displayed from his speeches. Despite his kindness, Reverend Putty was always in the most blunt way possible. Freaky. God, what, what? Why am I writing this shit into the script? TLDR, he loved women, getting with them and whatnot, including Florence. Even despite Dottie's advances, Florence pulls Putty aside and questionably gets him to have intercourse with her, with the only one in the audience of the scene to actually care, Officer Papermouth. He watched the embracing silhouettes get into bed, and in a fit of rage, Papermouth takes his daughter's love mom teddy bear outside and shoot at it, only to later regret his actions and run off with the mangled teddy bear. All of which happened in the prior episode, Sundays. By the end of it, Putty felt hopeless for having sex with Florence, while Papermouth felt hopeless for the fact that he couldn't be enough for his wife, both in the need to go into the bar with a man already there. Reverend Putty comes in first to forget about women, while Clay overheard Putty arguing with Florence from outside. Once sat down, Putty talks of finally trying to not go after women as part of something. His sacrifice. Clay questions Putty's promise, but Dolly reassures it makes sense for Putty to make those promises on Easter, just like Jesus. Clay refutes the point by saying Jesus knew what would happen and didn't care about his family enough to have crucifixion be considered a sacrifice. Meanwhile, Clay states that he can never be crucified because he has a family to take care of, which, he believes that alone, is considered a sacrifice for himself. I will touch upon this point later, but for a quick bit, while Jesus knows everything is a lot to explain, he did care about his family and disciples, especially after he rose from the dead. I get that Clay is drunk, but it doesn't make what he says good to the extent of the point itself being true. While Putty argues about Clay's drunken state, the spotlight then shines on to- Officer Papermouth walks in and thanks the pastor for his Easter sermon. Immediately, Buddy is hesitant to being at the bar and doesn't wish to talk to anyone else anymore. Clay instantly takes the advantage of putting the pieces together by antagonizing Florence and poking fun at Putty for not wanting to stay and talk to Papermouth. In his emotional state, Papermouth kept telling Clay to be thankful for Putty and to stop disrespecting his ex-wife. However, Clay kept pushing until... Hey! Get off! Close the door! Everything fell into place. She just loved those painkillers. Probably didn't even realize she was infected, right, Doc? Taking it back to the first episode of the season, Numb focuses on the struggles Alberta, Oral's mom, would go through once Oral and Clay were on the hunting trip. She would get... freaky... with some... freaky devices... And after an escapade of trying to find a spark in her life, she enters herself through the freakiness of an incredibly powerful freak machine. Okay. 
She goes to see her doctor, Dr. Potterswheel, about the injuries and he prescribes her medicine that would numb her to any kind of injury. Since then, she would injure herself with the freaky machine to see the doctor. The more visits, the more prescription increases, but also the tension that grew between the doctor and Wilberta, especially when she would talk about her injuries and he would treat her. Finally, when Wilberta hyper-focused on the doctor to get her spark, she realized that the doctor never really cared about her personally, he only cared about her injuries. As quick as he sent Wilberta off, the doctor quickly walked into the bar for no stated reason. Clay decided to confront the doctor about Wilberta, but did it in a way to explain his anger for everybody in a bar that makes him both right and wrong. Alright, a man, a priest, an officer, and a doctor all walk into a bar. The man stays loud and the others stay quiet. The man is not respected, yet the others, by their titles alone, are deemed respected. So what's the punchline? The wolves in sheep's clothing can never share the eyes of the wolf itself. Hmm. Hmm. Oral, how would you like to go on a father and son outing together? This is Clay Puffington, Oral's father and the quote-unquote main antagonist of the show. Clay was not like Oral. Both of them were happy in their own ways from their early childhood. But Oral relied on God and religious faith for his well-being, while Clay relied on his mom with her religion. This was all explained on Season 3, Episode 8, Passing. In it, the episode told that Clay's mom, Angel Puffington, was the guardian Clay idolized in every step, while he would deny actions from his dad, Arthur Puffington, and ignore his needs, even if it wasn't intentional. One night, Angela gave Clay the photo album to relive the memories that he shared. With one thing leading to another, Clay found out from the album that he would have had 10 siblings if it wasn't for his mom getting drunk or smoking. Only until she had Clay, she stopped all of it for God. This makes Clay question about his mom's worth for him. So he decides to pull a prank to see how much she cared about him, and yep, she, she definitely cared alright. After Angela's death, Clay and his father were left shattered. When Clay needed someone to guide him, he was met with his father, always angry at him. When Clay talked back to his dad for the first time, Arthur held his hand back and told Clay, You're not even worth it. Not worth it? The lot was Clay distraught from his mom's passing, but also angry at his dad for not being as considerate about his mom's passing. But Arthur never got over his form of grief, and Clay couldn't understand how his father acted for not knowing him. Making a clash between father and son, especially when Clay grew to accept pain as a sign of forfeitness, from both his dad and mom. He carried over incredible intelligence from knowing what made his dad tick and followed the Protestant faith, clean and religious, just like his mom. But when he met his soon-to-be wife Wilberta from someone else's wedding, that's when everything changed. When they both went to a party, Wilberta forced Clay out of his shell to start drinking and be himself, due to her own alcoholism. They had their fun, and after being lied to by Wilberta and manipulating him into thinking he needs her, they got married. But Clay went through such a severe change in his life, from both the alcohol he would genetically be attracted to, and the realization he needed more from life. It got to a point that he wasn't the same man that Wilberta met. Throughout Clay's life, though he did things he wasn't supposed to do, he never wanted the outcomes he was given, but coped with everything knowing that the pain he felt for so long made him worth something, when it wouldn't in the long run. When Clay came into the bar, he was discussing the trip, only to abruptly end to talk about not wanting to go to work. He says that working a job you don't like for a family is a sacrifice, which can't be true, but does that apply to him? After his mom's passing, he grew to not care about his family and grew to dislike his own the moment he married Wilberta. The only person he showed care to is Oral himself, and even that I would call a stretch considering the way he would treat him. First, when Reverend Putty came in with his promise, Clay clarified it being a sacrifice. Only then is when he became more weary of Putty. This was because, in Clay's mind, Putty was making the claim not to truly sacrifice something, but to escape accountability for his actions. Clay then used that to propagate his own sacrifice for family, which again, debatably works. Then, once Officer Papermouth came in with his sorrows, it would initially seem like Clay was only mocking Papermouth for essentially being unimportant to his ex-wife. However, considering Clay's comments and upbringing, it wouldn't be surprising to realize that Clay is mocking Papermouth for not standing up for his wife and taking her back for the sake of asserting dominance. 
things would finally start to fall into place for Clay once Dr. Potter's real walked into the bar. He figured out the dishonor the doctor would have not just on Blaberta, but his ex-wife as well. While it wasn't confirmed how his ex-wife died, a common theory is that Potter's wheel would get off to his wife's self-harm, making her push to the limit of pain with painkillers until she passed. This would explain the tension between the doctor and Blaberta, the fact that she would die peacefully from an illness never stated, and the fact that the doctor didn't defend himself from being called a wife murderer from Clay? Well, <laughs> I'm getting out of myself. Did the painkillers protect her from you, Doc? But what does that mean? You know, the pain of you, day in, day out, being there with that face, not knowing what to say, not caring anymore, not even knowing that you'll probably only care about her when it's finally too late, forgetting about all those desperate, those desperate years you spent alone, your barren years when no woman would even consider resting her tired head on your shaky little shoulder. I'm stinking of belly semen. Why even wipe? And then when you finally get one of these covered in pieces of tail that have been built up as the grand trophy in your nothing life, you try desperately to keep it. Not to protect it, but to hoard it. To keep it away from the other wolves and jackals circling your territory. And you realize, all too soon, that you're not good enough. That maybe there was a jerk-off called Darwin after all. And that you never acknowledged his existence because you knew deep inside that you were really what you feared you were. Weak and passive and ultimately broken by the ones who were made the fittest. And that through your weaknesses you built up a poison that poisoned others around you. <laughs> that you loved. And the only true justice was to let those dominant jackals feed on you, survive off you. If that one gets too sweaty, I got an extra one for you. In terms of what was referenced in the scene, no one truly gave out any of their words with their sacrifice. There was Putty's desperation for love that would make him go against his character, Papermouth's one-dimensional form of strength that would not make him better as an officer or father, and Potter's Wheel's twisted desires that would make his use of position as a doctor to get caught in his own pleasure through others harmed and deceived. None of these three would be proven better than Clay. However, he is in pain. He failed anguish from his family, trauma, and connections with the people that brought him down in his life. Even if Clay made a point of everyone else's sacrifice not having honor to them, he is no better with what he wants for himself. He wants to have worth for himself. But that worth to him is pain. That's why he would aggravate all three of the other guys in the end to fight him. For him to feel something. That's what turned his most vulnerable scene back to him just being a washed up dick. That's how Sacrifice became one of the best fall episodes in TV. Even if there is one more thing that makes it more interesting. The only sacrifice Clay truly made. Now remember, not a word to your mother. You know she has a weak heart. Well, th then maybe I shouldn't- Nonsense, come on, Clay. It's not loaded. Hold it like a man. Think back again to the episode passing. The entire point of that episode was to explain why Clay never really passed down the family revolver to Oral. His reason was shown in the end when his father was talking about breaking the tradition with him. There will be no coming of age hunting trip. I don't want this in my possession anymore. It's tainted with blood. Sure it's not just ketchup? No, look closer. You killed your mother with this gun. That weapon is Clay's trauma. Even if he never killed his mom, not even with the weapon in reference, it served as a domino that led to Clay not only becoming the monster he would become, but also escaping from the shell in his early childhood to become poisoned in his life. So by the end of the episode, when it flashes back to the scene from nature, Seeing Oral holding that metaphorical trauma... Eh, here, why don't you try this one instead? Oh... He had the knowledge of what he had, and sacrificed his family tradition for Oral's betterment. Even if Clay himself never took it seriously, he knew that weight would be carried over if he continued it. And he stopped it to make sure Oral wouldn't add more to that weapon when it inevitably would come. 
Oh, who am I kidding? My life is full of bright. You mean blight? Oh, God. Well, what's the matter? I hate myself. Well, that wait, Roll can see through his dad. He wouldn't carry what his dad had, especially what would come after sacrifice, and learn to build the happy family he deserved to have for himself. All because Clay did not set up the domino effect like his father would. That is the true sacrifice from Clay. Even if it didn't seem honorable for him to do so, the act himself still was. Clay's emotional roller coaster is exactly why this episode is as great as it is. Clay is a monster who has done terrible things, some of which can never truly be fixed with a simple apology. However, it doesn't change the fact that no one who called him out was truly any better. And it certainly doesn't change the fact that it can exist the duality of a corrupted self-worth with the proper understanding of what should be right, even if the latter can be bleak. Clay's character can be questionable if he never mentioned that one true sacrifice to anyone at the bar. But does he need to? The point of his tirade was to mention how he felt weak, and everyone else tries to be strong despite not living up to the strength for honor. There's no room to mention what he did, besides using his family as a sacrifice. However, even with Foral, he doesn't share enough love with his family to use them as a point of sacrifice, considering it's what he has, not what he truly wants. As he says in the first episode of the show, he can only love enough. I was just trying to be good, so you could love me more than you do now. Oh, Oral, I could never love you more. People only have a certain amount of love in them, and I'm afraid I have to divide mine up between at least a dozen people. Oh. But remember, son, I love you enough. I love you enough too, Dad. Also, in case that the dialogue or plot either is confusing or not structured good, just a reminder that the episode was taking plot points and seven episodes worth of content, so they, they had what they had to, I don't know, I, I still think it's fucking good. Despite that, it honestly felt great to finally talk about this series, even if it was just the one episode. I have a lot more to say about the series, and by that I mean I have 20 plus pages of a script for it, so who knows? Maybe if this video manages to do well, I'll rework that old script and turn it into a video. But until then, I don't really have a funny bit to end this video on, so this has been Manual D, and uh, Govlod, I, I don't fucking know.